Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Deciphering My Experience on Deciphering.tv. And I am happy to introduce to you from the studios in Alaska, <laughs> Rebecca Rose, who has uh, moved her way up north. And I have had the benefit of meeting down south in Grafton, Illinois, at the wonderful event that Tyler and Aaron put on. So uh, welcome to the studios today. Welcome to Alaska, Rebecca. How are hey, you doing? Thank you. Good to be here. Mm -hmm. So how was your trip up? Uh, it's been long. It's been long. I think it's still, I'm still traveling, so. Oh, fair uh, enough. I'm not done. Mm -hmm. About how long ago did you start your trek? Uh, end of June. Oh, nice. Yeah. And would you say it was um, all that you dreamed it would be heading north? Uh, it's good to be here. I don't know if the, the interim time was, you know, uh, it's good to get out of where I was. Oh. A, we could say that. Excellent. And the time on the ship, you know, I took a ship from this lower 48 up to Alaska, and that was pretty great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How long was that trek for, the uh, the ship portion? Almost a week. Oh, very cool. If I remember correctly, you said that um, <laughs> you were able to sent, set your tent up atop of the, yeah. the ship for the commute. Was that for the entirety of it? Yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. so it was windy and rainy and um, very real. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Fair yeah, enough. That's great. Um, how were the views? Awesome. Yeah, the whole coast of BC, you know, Western BC there is like really pristine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you get to see much um, animal life? Did you see any whales? We saw whales. Oh, yeah, excellent. Humpbacks and orcas. Oh, very yeah. cool. The yeah. orcas kind of freak me out when I see those videos of people like, you know, um, paddle boarding and, and um, stand up boarding and stuff like that. And the, the orcas around them are like, oh, wow, that's so cool. And I'm like, man, if I was there, I'd be terrified. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think you would mind kayaking around orcas? I, I don't know if I'd mind. Oh, okay. Maybe, maybe. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I would be freaked out for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now you're, um, you're, you're up here in Alaska and... Um, I know you have an, an SSP background for sure, even though, you know, we've just met, but we've spoken a bunch. And are there any, is there stuff that you've, like, are you really anticipating things here in Alaska? Like, I know we were just talking recently about the possibility of seeing UFOs and things like that. I only just breached the topic, but, you know, having said that, like, is, is this something that you've been considering for a while? The move north, you mean? Yeah. And, yeah. and, and I guess, and the... It, the connection to abnormal mm -hmm. stuff, paranormal things? Yeah, well, I think, you know, because I'll be moving higher, well, more into the interior and in a place where it's really good to see the northern lights and the skies are really dark within the Alaska Triangle. So mm -hmm. it, the anomalies are there mm -hmm. um, and things with Mount Hayes and a lot of stuff that goes on up here, I think, in the north that mm -hmm. isn't really maybe so talked about as uh, things we hear about with you within ufology in the south. Yeah, Fair so enough. I'll keep you posted about um, strange sightings up there. Oh, absolutely, please do. Yeah. Have you have you had any observations down in Texas where you were? Have you seen things in the skies? I definitely, yeah. There oh, okay. was, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, there's first of all, I would say I was living on the Mexican border, like maybe maybe 20 miles from the border, so it's really heavy with um, surveillance. So I would chalk up maybe even if 50 percent of my sightings there were um, man-made there were still a lot of anomalies mm. and craft i would say that were lit up that would make um they would come and disappear and make kind of circular motion in the sky and um at unique times uh like times when i was thinking something in my mind i would s see things in the sky like coincident mm -hmm. sightings um and it, certainly in west texas in the big open sky out there um I saw a lot of lights, and with other people who couldn't see what I was seeing, which is very strange mm -hmm. in, its, in itself. Which brings us, you know, up to the where are we in our uh, internal landscape that allows us or not allows us to see what's there? Like what appears to us? Is it um, contingent upon our? Uh, I don't know. Um, I, I can follow that. I, yeah. I, I, I'm. I'm going to butcher a story that I remember hearing about in history. It was something about, I believe it was the, the Native Indians in, I believe, the South American countries somewhere. And they were talking about when the, the Spanish, you know, came to the shores. And that they said these people, the, the local natives, were right on the beach. And these ships were approaching. And it would have taken a certain amount of time for them to set anchor, to get, you know, their 
their dinghies ready to row into shore, but they said that the, the locals didn't see these folk until they were stepping out of the breakers. And I've read stuff in science that says it was because it was like a like a cognitive break that they it, they never saw anything like that before. So their brain mm. like didn't even really give them the information until it was absolutely necessary. Yeah. And I think that might happen with UFOs a lot to people. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Uh, very much so. I, time and again, that's happened to me mm. where um, the lights in the sky and the clear craft are not visible to other people. Mm hmm. Um, oh, so you've you've seen that you've you've experienced that directly, where yeah. you were observing and and folks around you oh, were not. Yeah. Oh. And like they're not even seeing that there's this light that's. I mean, it's super bright in the sky, and it's going oh. back, disappearing and coming back around and doing this wow. over and over, and then flashing and disappearing. Everyone seems to be. Um, I think we don't fit, see what fit, doesn't fit into our um, frame mm -hmm. of reference. Wow, that's that's interesting. I've never heard somebody speak like that. It's really cool to. It's really cool. It's bittersweet, I guess, because in one way you would have preferred they saw it, but in another way you got to experience something that a lot of people don't get to witness. Maybe so. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So now, um, we first met just recently, basically at the. Um, yeah. Event in Grafton. Yeah. Well, and you gave a yeah, wonderful the presentation. Space, the Secret Space Conference, for people who might not know what that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, the Secret Space Conference. And that was, uh, I think, a really profound event. I think a lot of folks really didn't expect it to be such a big deal. It was almost like, I, I feel like, the Woodstock of the Secret Space community in a way. Yeah. Um, there was such a, a fantastic vibe. And I think that all of the speakers had wonderful stories but i think the shocking thing was how many people that were participating that were just present were there because they also had stories to tell and i feel yeah. like there's um there either is or will be uh, a a mass awakening of folks from the programs which is kind of what motivated me to come out and talk because i feel responsible to help i guess in a way triage and and mitigate this wave when it comes what are your thoughts on something like that with you know what your experience is with programs how many people have been in the programs and 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 how many may be about to wake up mm, that's a hard one well i would say just because i work as a energy intuitive and a seer and a channel and i do sessions with people i have i have contacts with clients that are uh, a bulk of my clients are people who have been in the programs and because I'm out speaking about my own experiences, there's a lot of people who contact me like every day. I think you and I both are getting contacts from people who have been in the program. So I would say it's a lot of people, but I, I don't know if I could put a number on it. But the, how it works with energy is the more people who are, it's sort of a, um, a tipping point where the more people who are talking, the more people continue to talk and to continue to wake up to their experiences. Um, yeah. Fair enough. So it's, yeah, number it's, wise, I don't know. We've talked about this in mm -hmm. the SSP community before. Like, how many people? How many thousands of people? Um, and how you know, if you think mm -hmm. about how many years with these, these programs have been running for decades, and mm -hmm. like how long? You know, when do we we put a point on the start of the secret space program? What about the um, yeah. in regards to the wake up rate and the possibility for a a teetering point? I that's one mm -hmm. of the things that. I feel personally is um, inevitable, and I don't know. I feel like I feel like it's getting closer. I feel like folks yeah. are waking up fast and furious, and I would, I'd like to help them out. But I just I'm just curious if you're seeing in in your work like you do um, work with folks on an energetic level, and I just wonder do you see a higher volume of activity on these topics? Yeah, but I to be honest, I don't know if it's because I'm speaking more and more openly and in more and more forums about it myself, or is it um, I, I do, it seems to be that there's more people waking up to it and that maybe we are reaching a certain tipping point. And that the, I think that the conference was able to go over so well and so smoothly. It was such great attendance and so much good energy there. It speaks to something of that nature as well. Mm -hmm. like if it wasn't time, that wouldn't have happened. Um, and so many people I know are going to want that to continue at an annual or, or, you know, have more gatherings where we come together and share our stories. Oh, absolutely. Because we have such a big audience. It's growing audience. Absolutely. It's, it's every, every single person that you talk to, every single person that I talk to, yeah. I feel like it's um, exponential growth. 
one of the things that I spoke with Tony Rodriguez about at, at these conventions is that, you know, it seemed like there was a time when folks were reticent to bring these discussions out because they didn't have all of the answers. They just had questions. But I think it's fair now that we can make these topics conversational without having to have all of the answers and just simply, you know, turn to someone who you've never discussed this topic with and say, you know, have you ever heard of the secret space program? Mm -hmm. And just yeah. see where their brain is at on it. And yeah. that we can, you know, just bring it up. It's that it's not a verboten topic anymore. And we were in a way almost suggesting that, you know, we all challenge each other to make these topics conversational and that in and of itself might be the greatest benefit to humanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And bringing up the topic of, well, UFOs, extraterrestrial life and, and mm -hmm. other intelligence in the universe and other dimensions. Yeah. And that too. Time travel seems Time travel. to be a topic as of late that people are going to have to, I guess, wrap their heads around. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I find that to be really interesting. I've, I've been myself, I guess, rather concerned with the topic and hoping people would pay attention but it just seems um a hard one for folks to digest do you, do you have many mm. thoughts on time travel or anything I, in your experiences <laughs> oh you want that, yeah, you know go might, into that? yeah absolutely um, i mean everything that i'm trying to do I'm, I'm i'm doing my best to take from my experiences and just connect with others and their experiences hopefully for the benefit of everybody out there. Um, sometimes we hit the mark and sometimes we miss, but all we can do is try. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a sensitive topic, but, you know, I was in the Montauk Project myself back in the 70s. So I was born in 72, and in the late 70s I was taken to Montauk. Um, that had a connection with my godfather. And there I was used in experiments in time. Um, and people know about the Montauk Project or different very iterations of what may have happened there. Uh, I just had somebody uh, contact me today who said they had a similar story to mine, memories from there. And it's it's more and more common that we're, um, at least that I'm coming in contact with people who were used in some way in those experiments. Mm -hmm. um, but I was used, uh, yeah, to, my mind was altered there and used to look into different variants um, like in the future mm -hmm. um, in really painful ways in Montauk I so we know we all know about you know this has been used by the military for a long time that's that's more the stuff that I want to get to yeah. I'm not I am not looking to press you on the details of yeah. of the of the trauma well, from your it's, past it's, but it's, it's but just, great to talk about all of it mm -hmm. yeah but so then from your experience there's no doubt in your mind that time travel is going on there are factions that are working with these things, and it may not necessarily be to the benefit of everybody out there. Is it safe to say that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because it, I think it was all for conquest and domination that we were using those experiments. Like the ultimate end would have been to um, change outcomes so that there could be a, um, manipulation. Mm -hmm. and a, yeah, I, th I guess I said it, a conquest. Mm -hmm. I, I can follow that. And I also, think, they're, you know, exploring what could be done, what are the limits, out of the outer limits of this with a human subject and a non-human subject. I think a lot of people would be really surprised as to the cold-heartedness of these programs under the uh, the pretense of science. Just like you said, mm -hmm. that they, they, were, they would say, we're, oh, we're inquiring, we're trying to check the limits thereof. That's science. Well, by one definition, yes, technically that's correct, but from a moral standpoint, there's a lot of questions to be asked. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't, I mean, as a, again, coming back to the work that I do now in the world, which is really why I was vetted for the programs to begin with, it was because I had, you know, kind of more inherently activated uh, psi abilities. Um, I would say that I'm in the camp where I would say that there is, you know, past, present, and future are all existing in a quantum field mm -hmm. at once. It's not really separate, and they're just capitalizing on that and seeing what can be done in this, you know, th third density with it. Um, but it's manipulating the trajectory of time. Yeah, yep. I agree with that. Yeah. I, I think my concern as of late is the problem seems to be that so many factions have these technologies in their hands. Granted, they're a minority of the total population of the planet. But they're apparently, because of the technologies they wield, seemingly the more powerful component compared to we, the people, the masses that are naive to the technologies being used about us. 
Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so. in the wrong in the hands of the wrong people. But right. but the thing is I would also say that we can learn to you know, you and I talked about me looking for I'm looking for real estate, right? Like mm-hmm. visualizing um, the outcome of what I'm looking for, like yes. as a co-creative, the p- co-creative powers of the human race are mm-hmm. exponentially, I mean, they're huge. Totally. So yep. we can use the same principles in a, in a maybe more generalized way to affect our lives and yeah. the outcomes, or we could talk about the collective out- affecting the outcome of this particular, what we might call a timeline or this, mm-hmm. this paradigm that we're living in. Um, within the matrix i couldn't agree more i think i think unity in humanity is the key to our survival our salvation however people want to title it i believe there's a a practical function to the unified voices literally Mm. of human beings i think there was something that that's what the cathedrals of old allude to that Mm. there was these these for all practical purposes, these machines, these amplifiers, acoustically designed to pack with human beings, and then they had leadership that taught them the right things to say at the right times, and the cues, and the notes, and I believe that unity and that strength of voice was something to be seen when done correctly. Mm -hmm. So I think that the powers that be contemporarily are aware of these things from antiquity. Yes. And they're Absolutely. doing everything they can to keep us from knowing the power of our unity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's also well said. Mm. So, <laughs> another, <clears throat> pardon me, another topic that we had been um, dancing around in your visit here is that there's a, this idea lately that there's a war on consciousness which is an idea that I, I do support. I think it's unfortunate that it's going on. I'm not trying to be a naysayer. I'm just trying to be like um, Paul Revere riding through the streets and just saying the British are coming, the British are coming, um, just to motivate the folks that need yeah. to be motivated so that we can win this dang war. Yeah, well, it's been going on a long time. It's just take, began to take nuanced new forms, um, mm-hmm. become higher tech, I think as we've gone along through what we call time. What what do you have to say on the idea of tech, right? So a lot of folks um, don't necessarily understand the connection between consciousness and tech or the threat thereof. Is there anything that you can speak to from your experiences that could educate people such? Um, so you said people aren't, just to reiterate, uh, um, not understanding the difference between tech and consciousness? Correct. That the the I I my presumption is that the general population is not aware of the technology that exists mm-hmm. that is a threat to their consciousness. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm I'm, yeah. I'm I'm working to get this information out to the public. So yeah. in the decipher of my experience, I'm certainly looking for other people that may have experiences that could corroborate the things that I'm trying to be the bell ringer for. Is there anything in your experience where you go, you know what, Eric, there is some technology out there that people need to be concerned about. I've seen it. (laughs) The things we carry in our pockets every day. Oh, okay. (laughs) It's not that complicated. (laughs) Fair enough. (laughs) So, okay. So you you think cell phones are problematic? Well, (laughs) they distract us from working on our consciousness and they are, you know, they're carrying microwave signal in our pockets all the time. What is that connected to? I mean, like I was saying to you the other day, man, I don't ever turn my location on in my phone it's a tracking beacon Mm -hmm. ever Mm -hmm. like when i was trying to find your house and i'm like oh i'm just gonna i'm not listening to the lady talk on the 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 map quest or whatever it is Mm -hmm. um yeah i mean i'm a i'm a meditator i meditate every day in the morning and then probably again in the evening when i can um and to me that is how i can at a personal level um be working uh to um, I don't know, I want to say win the war on consciousness, but, but contribute to, you know, um, reducing the effects of what's been going on around us mm-hmm. for me to stay in a certain frequency and, you know, keep in separation consciousness rather than unity consciousness and just becoming more aware of the, um, the multiverse, the you, multidimensional realm that we live in. You could be more in the mash unit. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. You don't. You don't have to be a rifleman. You can certainly be a a mash unit in the war on consciousness. Totally. Totally. That's <laughs> that's my way. Like you want to. Yeah. You want to pick up your weapon and you know do something. And, totally understood. Right. And so we mm-hmm. can have both. You know, the more masculine approach and maybe the more feminine approach. Absolutely. If you want to put it like that. Yeah. Um, 
for yeah. sure for sure i i ultimately i just want everybody to have freedom of their consciousnesses back yeah i see i see the aggressions occurring i see the the you know transgressions i guess you'd say or people approaching literally contemporarily i feel like it's trespassing going on mm -hmm. with the technology yes and people aren't aware of this they yeah. they yeah. we don't have the words for it but there are interminglings like you mentioned because of the cell phone and the technologies that exist and people don't they don't want to believe that yeah because you know? it's well yeah i think your viewers know this you know we're addicted to the tech that we have like the common technology of of the internet and our phones and so on mm -hmm. you know that's really everywhere it's ubiquitous i'm very much concerned that you know while we while we operate contemporarily under this conversational banner of you know oh be careful of 5g when 5g gets here they're going to have mind control and that's when it's going to come and it's like you know what we that's already, a pro yeah that's, 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 yeah it that happened from going. day one and mm -hmm. way back when mm -hmm. nobody would have believed that a cell phone can be a weaponized mind control technology so it wouldn't even matter if you brought it up back then mm -hmm. people would have laughed and been like oh yeah and my beeper has been telling me what to purchase from you know yeah. <laughs> sears roebuck yeah and that's why i'm interested in moving further off grid to like i'm I'd be totally fine living without cell phone connection. Absolutely. And away from the towers and whatever they're beaming, mm -hmm. beside the signal that runs my phone. I mean, I don't know. Right. But just the EMF from that, too. And just getting back into right relationship with the sacred world and um, spiritual practice, the spiritual nature of our human existence and um, the, the land and so on and so forth. And like out of this kind of program that I've been designed to live in. Yeah, I, be, I believe, unfortunately, you're right, that all of these technologies have um, secondary and tertiary things that aren't what they presented, what they sell it for, what they charge us for yeah. on the front end. Mm -hmm. um, but I also agree with you a thousand percent that there's a greater power, something that they're hiding from us, something they're misinforming us on mm -hmm. and doing everything they can to keep us ignorant about. And that's where I believe our unity comes into play by us mm -hmm. all. Uh, communicating about the things that are special in our lives our experiences and we can start to reconnect the dots mm -hmm. I feel like it's almost in a way like a um, <laughs> a long-term blockchain effective information that the truth is all still out there in pieces throughout humanity mm -hmm. and if we could just learn to connect again to get into some sort of appropriate harmony we've been put into disharmony We've been placed into disharmony by the intentions of a few. But if we, the majority, can get ourselves back into harmony, I, f I almost feel like <laughs> like a song will fire up and all of a sudden we'll all just become enlightened or something by just, you know, getting <laughs> rid of the, the agents of disharmony. That, yeah. you know, almost like entering that cathedral and being under proper conductorship, singing the right song, just brings us all together like the the the, the phrase that a, a rising tide raises all ships mm. that type of stuff yeah yeah well the the insidious nature of the the tech interference is so many there's so many levels and there's so many levels of inversion like i mean again i think your your view, your audience is probably familiar with all this but um hey we're growing we get we, new people every day yeah we have you know we are the highest technology there is if we yes. look at the human heart and the human energy field that's mm -hmm. connected to that and in the whole beyond our solar system into the galaxy into the cosmos mm -hmm. we're always it's written in our cellular memory that's a kind of technology our dna is a technology yes so we absolutely. have our own equal access to very high level tech there's so many layers to us and i feel that it's funny when you know contemporarily everybody's you know concerned about AI, you know, artificial intelligence. And yeah. it's really, it's a joke because all they're really trying to do is, you know, take some mechanical stuff, switches and things like that, and have it emulate the human mind function, which is still only one aspect of who we are. We're more, we have more on us on an energetic level. We have more on us on a heart level. A human being doesn't need to be afraid of AI because it's not really actually even artificial intelligence. It's just artificial intellect because it doesn't have experience like a human. It's like a book has knowledge mm -hmm. in it, yeah. but the book doesn't have experience. So certainly there's information in there, um, and it's just like a computer in AI. Yep, there's information in there, and it can make a, a, a pseudo decision. Yeah. But it's well, like off of reading books, not of making experiences. 
I could share something interesting from oh, my experiences go for on, it. Uh, on Mars when I was um, I'm I was you know kind of trained into what we would call a um, colloquially a, colloquially a super soldier. I don't mm. really like that term. I would call a combat slave, a Delta combat slave, mm. being more appropriate to the. I think that's more indicative job. of reality. Yeah. Um, mm. And we were sent, our commanders had set something up uh, intentionally to allow this, and we're going to talk about time, you know, these, there were uh, Japanese, uh, very AI super soldiers um, coming in from the future, and they'd allowed them to infiltrate our ranks. And they wanted to see, our commanders wanted to see, again, intentionally, um, how long it would take us to notice that and what we would do about it. And in the end, there was this timeline war between trying to take us into this extremely AI future and in the end, they didn't win because those beings were completely, almost completely AI, and they couldn't think for themselves. Mm-hmm. I think it's really interesting, you know, that the, the human component is so needed. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's never really going to trump what we would call a, artificial intelligence. Right. There's no, um, there's no uh, intuitive aspect. There's no rogue component. There's no outside the box, per se. Yeah. And that... Um, I would say loose cannon aspect has some <laughs> value at times, you know, that yeah. it's this um, this unknown that the that the opponent would have to deal with. Yeah. That makes the, the victor the loose cannon. Yeah. And the creative thinker. Um, yes. There you somebody go. Somebody who's still able to be in touch with the, the creative power of the universe. I would almost say original thinking, actually. Then when yeah. you say that, when you say creative thinking, I would say that a human being is capable of original thought. Mm-hmm. And I would say that yeah. artificial intelligence, it's not the same thing. It's like pseudo-original thought. It's, there's got to be a different word for what a, an AI is doing. It might come up with something it's never thought before, yeah. but it's, it's not the same as a human being who's coming up with different things through experiences. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't, I don't even know how to make the distinction of, of a supposed intellect that's not actually in the environment that we're in like you know i don't want to say that it's not real but it's its senses are different it's it's sensory inputs are different than ours Mm -hmm. so it's not having the same experiences so it's not coming to the same ideas and conclusions yeah yeah i think there's always going to be a ceiling on that that's not tapped into the spiritual plane i like that choice of words there's there's a ceiling on its ability to yeah interact in our environment yeah. it's doing a lot of a lot more guessing than we think mm-hmm. we also have built into us and i i say this as an akashic record reader you know i see how much people can draw on and do draw on past lives parallel experiences so again we're kind of talking about is that in a loose way maybe about time and how that's again written into the cellular memory and we can pick up on that in a really beautiful way, it's always yeah, we can learn to tap into that to inform our experience and how we are shaping what we call the future. Mm-hmm. How long would you say that you have been functioning as an Akashic record reader? Oh, probably about. Uh, wow, well, it's been so. Oh, hang on. <laughs> Fair enough. Take I don't your know, time. Probably is it five, eight years, seven, eight, nine? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Let's say eight years. Okay. Yeah. And now. For for my own specificity, I know you think that the audience is wildly educated, but we'll yeah, give it to this are, one, me too, not. right? And I'm not <laughs> knocking them, but yeah. for me, you know, I I don't know that I've ever crossed paths with someone that stated that with such specificity. So mm. I would I want to ask for clarity. Yeah. What is your definition of the Akashic records? Mm-hmm. And so, <laughs> yeah, it's a a record of the soul's journey over lifetimes. Um, it's pretty simple in that way if we think about um, a repository that lists, exists in the quantum field that allows us to have access to what we've been and maybe into the future too. Uh, like I said, parallel experiences. And kind of the lessons over um, many lifetimes, like a lot of times a, a journey like our, my lifetime, this, this this round, you know, has a overarching um, uh, a teaching, you know, something I'm I'm trying to fulfill or or experience or find out about, um, and that oftentimes will throughout the soul's journey have presented in other lifetimes in different ways, or you know, you can look at all of that within the akashic field. Are you familiar with Edgar Casey? 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I remember reading about Edgar Casey that I thought was really interesting was that, you know, they they had a whole bunch of folks studying him and what he was up to. They documented it. It's it's all referenceable, folks. Please look into Edgar Casey. Very interesting mm-hmm. human being. But I was intrigued that at one time they said that, um, you know, they asked him, you know, um, you can see this and you can see that and, you know, there's the Akashic records as he was discussing as well. And yeah. they said, you know, it was amazing that they, no matter what question Edgar Casey was asked, he had an answer because he said that he can go to the Akashic records. But there was one question they asked him mm-hmm. and they said, um, how come everybody else isn't doing what you're doing? And he said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that mm-hmm. blew my mind because it's like, I feel like in so many ways, like, um, a lot of these psychic abilities or the ability to read Akashic records, mm. I believe should be happening with everybody. And something happened. I don't know how, all of the answers, but, you know, if you were to be speaking biblically, this might be when they were referring to the fall of man or mankind that, you know, maybe we were connected to these things in antiquity and now we're more distanced. Mm. Yeah. But I think of it like um, innate abilities in a way that, like being able to play guitar, theoretically. Anyone can play guitar. You could play guitar. I could play guitar. It just matters on how hard you try. Some people may be prodigies. Some people may have to work really hard to be. You have to, to practice. Be, yeah. You have to practice. But I think a lot of these things are just like you just said. It's stuff that we would have to practice for sure. Yeah. Especially if we've never done it, right? If you've never played a guitar, you got to practice. But especially because we've never been told we can do it. Right, and unbinding all the training and conditioning programming that we had, that that, that stuff is a bunch of BS. Yeah. And there's, no, there's, no, there's no place for that. Just right. go along to your jobs and pay your bills and, you know, oh my God, be on your yes. phone. Yes. <laughs> so it comes back to the original, you know, developing of consciousness and um, making contact.